Hey everyone, we're live here with Noah Eshed of Bold Digital Architects. All right, so we're gonna talk about something that's really been on my mind and Noah totally understands this. So she's a great content writer and we'll get to her and her content in a second. But for those that don't know, if you might not know this, there's a lot of virtual sig uh, signaling going on in society lately. Basically, a lot of people saying, this is how you should treat employees, this is what you should do, this is what you should be. Always talking about saying, we do this, we do that, uh, saying they stand for certain things. But really what I'm finding is, personally, is that, uh, which we all know, actions speak louder than words, but there's a lot of words out there. They're just trying to get all the credit for the action without doing it. Um, it's not just, uh, lazy, but it's actually immoral because you're pretending you stand for something. You're pretending you're, do, you're doing things to help people, but in actual reality, you're not. Anyway, when it comes to actually doing good work and actually caring and putting kind of, you know, the money where your mouth is, so to speak, um, there's very few people and other marketers that I'd like to speak to. And that's why I'm speaking today with Noah Eshet and I'm bringing you here for you guys to watch her. So Noah's awesome. Noah's uh, a co-founder and CEO of a uh, Bold Digital Architects. So, no, why don't you first tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your agency. She has a digital marketing agency that she runs, and uh, specifically a little bit about this topic and why you thought that it was so imperative that we speak about this now. Great. Thank you. So, first off, thank you for inviting me. This is like the first time I'm doing a LinkedIn Live, and I love it. You're actually like, uh, I think, the only, you're like the only person in Israel who's uh, able to do LinkedIn Lives, right? Right, actually, uh, David Yahid just got it recently, and I went live on his. I helped him last week. He's the first per awesome. individual I know that has it. So if anyone else happens to have it, let me know. I would, uh, uh, if you need any help getting set up, because it's freaking complicated. Uh, you do it through third parties and da 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 da, da. I, You know, I'm, I, what took me months of learning early in 2019, I can help you with now. Amazing. So, yeah, uh, if I ever need it, then I'm just going to come to you, okay? A little bit about me and the Anytime. agency. So, uh I hope, I think we're having a little delay, so we'll try to overcome it. Uh, about my agency first. So my agency's forte is content marketing. Uh, and basically in a world where uh, content really does matter uh, because it's helpful for uh, getting customers and prospects to trust you. And because there's a forced research showing that 70% of a sales decision is made before anybody speaks with a salesperson. So uh, prospects and clients are actually reading uh, and what we do best is make sure to get the right content out there so that uh, prospects can actually trust the company and choose a company. And we do it through uh, social media efforts and through blogging uh, and through SEO. Uh, but SEO, that's not like conservative SEO, which is about dumping keywords and just writing for search engines. Uh, it's SEO that uh, actually tries to get people to find things that they're looking for and add value. And I'll add to that, that Google is also becoming smarter. So old school SEO of just dumping keywords doesn't really work anymore. And I appreciate it because Google are really trying to understand what people are trying to search for, what their intent is. And they will bring to the top of the results those content pieces that people stay, read, and seem to actually gain from. Um, so that's like the gist of what we do at the agency. Uh, on top of that, I have a podcast that I'm very proud of called Real Life Superpowers. I do it uh, with a co-host called Renan Minipaz, and it's about peak performance. And we interview people that we identify as peak performers. Uh, we've been very lucky to have people on, such as Brent Halligan, the co-founder and CEO of HubSpot, and Rand Fishkin uh, from Moz. He's like the founder and used to be the CEO. Uh, we had people like best-selling authors, uh, many different people. It's been going on for a while. Uh, it's been really insightful to conduct like real honest conversations. It's a good excuse also to pick up uh, the phone and speak with somebody who you really look up to or, or have read your book and have follow up questions. Uh, and in a sense, I think, you know, all these conversations like the one we're having now are like really thought provoking and get people to really look inside themselves and see how they can become better. And that's like a life mission of mine. Awesome. When did this mission start? Kind of like to... Uh... When, when was there like a click where you're like, you're like, this is what I want to do? With respect to the podcast, you're asking? Yes, with respect to the podcast, yeah. Yeah, that's a good I question. So, mm -hmm. so, no, so for me, like, I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm asking. For me, it comes in like two waves, right? Uh, first, as I say I want to do something, I decide I want to do it. And then I spent a whole lot of time saying I'm going to do it to myself and I don't actually do it. And then something usually happens, click, something I've been thinking is like, this is important to me. I want to do it. It could be a few years and then something happens and I just suddenly do it, right? 
Uh, yes. Like, did that happen? Was that happen with you, or am I unique in the sense that I chew things over way too long and then I just suddenly implement it? Some I, yeah, I don't think you're unique at all. Uh, I think there's this type of entrepreneurial right. mom said I was unique. Oh, you're uh -huh. so unique, yo. But like, in <laughs> thank your you. Own no. way, <laughs> but with respect to what you're asking, I think like for entrepreneurs, uh, and I think that's like uh, something common between us and probably a lot of our listeners. Um, there's this, uh, sometimes they procrastinate, we procrastinate because we don't know how to approach something because we're paving a road to something that didn't exist before. And that, that right. requires, uh, some sort of courage. And also, you know, you, you sort of have to sort of ground it and understand what the roadmap is and how you're actually going to make it happen. And uh, sometimes I think that thing that clicks is just how the how how am i going to execute this how am i going to make this right. this vision a reality so yeah, with respect to my podcast it was just like a passion i i'm very passionate about podcasts i'm also heavily involved uh in a in a startup uh, that has to do with uh, audio uh, called trinity audio um and i listen to podcasts all the time for years and i listen to audio books and i followed a few podcasts that i found super super inspiring and it became a sort of dream of mine to also have one of my own. And I didn't know how to do it, but I started reading about it and sort of, I don't know, just sleeping on it. I don't know, running it in my head. Uh, and it took a while. It did take a while. And I uh -huh. sort of felt ready at some stage. I think maybe it's sometimes also about finding the right partners. So I hooked up with my co-host and he was more of like a, let's not overthink this. Let's just turn on a mic and see where it goes. Get somebody who is you know, close to us, interview them and see how that rolls. Uh, we did that and it worked. Uh, and we started, you know, just building it up from there. Uh, I'm very process oriented. So I had to have a process. So I had to do research and I had to understand exactly what the operation is. And, you know, all the way down to the technicalities of having a soundtrack and understanding who is going to produce this and how it's going to be, you know, what the format is. Uh, so I think having a partner that sort of balances you in the, okay, but let's do it uh, is key. Uh, and we did. And I, I got to say, it's like beyond my dreams with respect to the actual guests, because you never cool. know. There's so many podcasts out there and the chance to get like real tier one uh, guests. And, and tier one is not I'm not saying as if there's ranks among people, but I'm saying, I mean, there's right. different ranks within achievements. People achieve different stuff and reach certain peaks. Right. And I'm interested in those who have that mindset and reach a certain peak because they want to understand how they think and I want to try and learn from it. Uh, so getting those people on board is uh, is something I'm very grateful for. for. We see a question here, and, and the Neil name wants is to Real know. Life Superpowers. Yeah, he wants to see your podcast. Yeah. What's it called? Real Life Superpowers. Real Life Superpowers, awesome. And you have a regards from Ornella Wool. I believe you know her. I don't know who she is. Um, hello, what's up, Ornella? If anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to ask them. We will be addressing them. Uh, there is a little bit of lag, maybe like up to 60 seconds between when you type and when we see it. Um, Awesome. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, I've been doing lives for a year and a half, but just recently I was like, why isn't it, I'm doing all the work? Why am I not making this into a podcast or whatever? So I just started to do that, which people can find, you know, just search to Yo Will Israel podcast or search for Yo Will Israel on YouTube. Um, awesome. Actually, there's, actually, it's going to be hard because there's a, there's two big MMA fighters, one named Yoel Romero and another one named Israel Sling else. There's like a big fight between them. So actually any SEO with my name is just gone. <laughs> so which yeah, means now I can be right with and if I have a bad rate, I'll never be on page one. So I take ads out. I take Google ads out on my name, of course. Uh, so people can, Just change people the name, find. not your name. Don't change your name. My name. There it is. Right, right, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Uh, probably not. I will see. I don't know. I mean, I have a few other podcasts that I want to do and I get in the work. So I want to talk a little bit about content marketing and then we'll get into kind of like the main things that we're going to talk about. Um, sure. So when, when you need to write up content, right, how do you decide, like, what's the first thing? Like, how do you decide what to research, how to research? What are the questions that you ask people um you know just like to kind of get a better idea from your side from your end of course absolutely i just want to just want to clarify something i rarely write write it myself uh i'm more like overlooking the operation so my team do the writing uh but process wise i think the steps that are commonly missed are a real deep understanding of the product and the service uh and a real deep understanding of the landscape because when I think some companies fall in love with themselves 
and are busy talking about what they do, uh, but they sort of write it from very features oriented perspective and they are under uh, a wrong assumption and it's wrong uh, that people understand uh, why that feature matters uh, and why they should care. Uh, and in a world where people's attention span is pretty much of a goldfish, a uh, few seconds, you're in the, we're in the business of grabbing attention, uh, not in a manipulative way, but in being able to be very, very specific on the benefits as a business that you're providing. So I think one of the core challenges for a good core marketer and for a business uh, is to really understand what are the benefits that we're offering, not what the features are. So how do I take those features and make them into benefits? And one practical tip to do that is actually to ask, to, to write down the sentence that you want to say, and then see if you can ask, so what about it? Um, I didn't make it up. It's a, it's a guy called Ken Evoy. Uh, I read it years ago and it changed the way I look at texts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very meaningful. Because once you can, you cannot ask, so what about a sentence right. detailing what a company does, you, you're suddenly got something going on. So the idea is to research, to understand what you're really offering, and then to uh -huh. understand how you can say it in a way that's a benefit. And, but, and to also understand where you stand with respect to the competition, because you know, one common thing that I hear a lot is we don't have competition. You do. You do, even if it's not there. I'm reading, I'm reading Peter Thiel, Zero to One, and he talks about how uh, monopolies, like, you know, like to say they don't have competition, so they don't run into problems with antitrust or people think they're taking advantage or price gouging. Yeah, yeah, I read that uh, years ago, and it's not And then wrong, uh, but... tend to be much bigger than they are. Right, yeah, I know, but I don't blame yeah. either of them. I mean, in, in general, so it's... Uh, but then, of course, it goes into how to have no competition. That's that's the goal here, how to become a monopoly. But I don't want to switch topics. Uh, just quick things. No, but, even, to but, Nadia... but just, to, just to clarify, sorry, just to clarify, you know, everybody has a competition because even if it's not direct, at the end of the day, uh, your, They're all uh, your, your prospects are going to choose you or an alternative. Uh, right. And I have, I can't even think of one example of a business that doesn't have an alternative. It doesn't have to be direct. That's where people, but businesses fall in love with their features and don't understand those features are a bit of a blah, blah to the end user who wants a solution, he wants the benefits. So it's really important to be grounded and also modest. Like being arrogant is very dangerous for a business. Uh, I, I agree with that as someone who... As someone who's been arrogant himself. Uh, from Facebook, we got a comment. Ali Sheva, Katie Hudson says, a great topic. Would love to hear if there's a difference between a solopreneur whose brand is them versus a bigger business. No, I don't think there is. I think a solopreneur actually has an advantage here because uh, I think just like a, to generalize, a solopreneur will tend to be more self-critical uh and we'll be able to sort of lay out their vision and i think maybe trouble start uh when there's a team uh, and they don't always agree on what the benefits are and what the vision is which sort of ties down to what we also wanted to discuss about ben about a mission statement and about vision so i think you know when you're a solopreneur it's pretty clear to you and then it's just a matter of of conveying your message to the world and to sort of conveying, you know, what made you excited about this thing. Uh, I'll say, for example, and I'll give an example, which is a cliche, but about a nonprofit. So nonprofits have this, uh, sometimes they have this notion that what they're doing is important and that it's pretty much enough to say, yeah, we're hel helping, I don't know, to save, uh, hung to, to, to help hungry people and you should care because it's important. And the sad truth is that, and this is true for any business, not just for nonprofits, is that everybody at the end of the day has to choose what to support. And your job as a business is to show them what made your heart sing and made you so passionate about this, this uh, whatever, this purpose or whatever it is that they should now join you and become your tribe. And just, you know, sort of grouching and saying because it's important doesn't cut it. It just so doesn't I, meet reality. Right. So I, I, I just want to comment on a little bit about a, a, what you said about solopreneur and add some of what you did there. Like you, what you were saying. So it is true. I mean, like 
as someone who was once a solopreneur uh, and has now grown a business and there are many, uh, there's about 10 people on our team now. I mean, I remember to be able to do whatever I want. Even the processes weren't even important because everything was in here. You know what I mean? I didn't have to communicate with people through, uh, through my yeah. team, through other channels. Um, you, you're so much more nimble. You can do things much faster. You can punch 10 times your weight. It's unbelievable, especially if you hustle, you grind, and you're hungry. Uh, but there are there is an advantage when you work with the bigger businesses of the things that you can't do is that yeah. you're bringing in perspective and you're sometimes you're forced into constraints which in general are bad but if you understand that the constraints other people that are part of your team that have the same goal as you do and you bring them in to have the same goal their constraints and their different perspective might actually help you grow see things differently and actually expand so um, I've been able to get uh, a better perspective on that alone Kaplan thinks that you are correct uh, Nadia says we are in business of grabbing attention loved it which is totally true marketers love attention and are there but like, nothing bothers me more than another b2b another b2b marketer who basically is not active on on linkedin or like or that does services for their clients they don't do for themselves often right like if you were to do ads but you don't do ads for yourself or imagine if you did no content marketing yourself but you do it for other people right this is you know it, it, it's uh i'm seeing a lot of it and that, that ties right into our subject so let's just jump into it because we're already 15 minutes into this so a lot of people talk the talk. A lot of people like to say, we do this and that, and we're a really special company. And I'll uh, give an example. They might like highlight, let's say, on their pay, on their social pages, how great they are with their, how they treat their employees, as an example, or look at all our outings and all this and that. Uh, you know, it's a, gr a great example, um, Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, for those that don't know, she was like, she always talks about kindness, be kind, be kind. And it turns out she's like the biggest stat asshole there is everyone on her team from the cameraman really? everyone you didn't hear about this nope oh my god you got a lot there's like dozens of people have come out how she treats people uh, from her team everyone from the entire board so she talks about kindness people talk about x y and z but they don't do x y and z it's all a show they want a virtue to let other people think you know virtue signal hey look at me i really care and then um I'm doing great stuff. And then in the end, they're actually not doing anything. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of this. I'm seeing a lot of this in business. I mean, this isn't abnormal for celebrities, also sometimes for politicians, but it's kind of expected a little from politicians or not. We're not as disappointed uh, because there's that power structure there. But so what do you, why do you think, what is it? Do you think it's a breakdown in communication internally? So let's start with like uh, saying we're a great place to work, right? What is it the difference between that, how people like to peacock and say we're like the best place to work, and then what it's actually like? Why is there a match Sorry, you there? got cut off for a second, but yeah, okay, I heard I heard the question. So I think the answer is obvious. Uh, there's an incentive and a clear one uh, to, be, to be perceived as that place that's great to work uh, because people want good uh, people on their teams and good people, any, any person would want the place they work with to be a great environment. Uh, and then there's the reality. So uh, it's like uh, on a dating site, you know, people are always trying to be their best selves and it doesn't always right. meet reality. Um, and I don't even know exactly how that can be overcome. I mean, I would, my, my advice would be more from a perspective of having, uh, of advising actual, you know, people who are, you know, uh, candidates to work at such places uh, to not just rely on manipulative or cliche messaging and go and talk to people, uh, which which is also true for marketing. You know, you have all these marketing messages, but at the end of the day, uh, clients are informed. So it's not just what you say about yourself, but they're also going to be talking to other clients. Maybe so it's, it's very much depends on you know how much how much how many stakes there are in a deal. If it's a no biggie and a person can take the risk of just believing the marketing message and they can always cancel, then it's cool. But you know, the larger the the, the more there is on stake, then the, the more people are going to have to research. But, you know, if you're asking from a values perspective of why should a company lie, uh, of course they shouldn't. Uh, but I think maybe... Well, right, no shit, but why do they? Do you, think it's a, do you think it's a mismatch internally? Do people... Do, they don't know they're lying, right? Like, they, I feel like those that are, let's say, do, do they know? Like, do they understand yeah, that yeah. there's... Or wouldn't say lying. Because I, I, I think lying might have, a, have an intent to mislead, kind of. Um, let's just say that they're not giving a proper reflection of what it's actually like to work at a place. I mean, much like yeah. Instagram, right? Like what 
you share about you know, assume you're vacationing 24 hours and you live in a bikini, right? <laughs> the real, the truth is, you know, you might be a parent running around taking your kids around, trying to work, staying up late, falling asleep at your desk, who knows what else, struggling to work out, keep waiting, like, you know what I mean? Like any other one, any other person, but people aren't seeing that. I mean, would you just say it's just a base, just a social media thing more than, more than anything else? It's just kind of like, like kind of what you said about like the dating sites. It just, we kind of want to show the best of us and we're, and we're kind of going to conceal all of our blemishes. Yeah, I think it's like, it's like the highlight rail, but I think, um, I think that there's got to be some line that has to be drawn. So there's like hi hiding a little bit of blemishes and there's flat out portraying a, an unrealistic uh, reality. So if you know, like the Alan DeGeneres example, that's quite a good one because if at the end of the day, it's like a horrible environment to work with, then it's not going to last. You know, a person's going to go and work there. And they're not going to achieve what they want because the yeah, person she's been doing this for like over 10 years and you know okay, what I mean? And it's just churn? been coming out for like the last few months, you know? So what's the churn of employees there? I'm sure it's high. I'm I sure have no idea. High. I'm, I'm assuming, I, I would, mean, I would assume, but you know, I think right? a lot of I the mean, people sacrifice to be on like, which like the number one now and number one, number two, like talk show hosts in the world or something or yeah, in, the, in yeah. America, at least. I mean, people bust their balls to get there and then they finally get there and they're like, okay, this place is terrible. That's tragic. That's tragic. But, you know, a person, yeah, people have to make their own decisions. If they end up manipulated into such a role and they decide to stay, then that's on them. And I feel sorry for them because I, I don't judge that because I understand, you know, you're, you're, you're at a position where you suddenly landed your dream job and it can even take five years to realize you actually hate it. But maybe along uh, the way, you know, maybe along the way you have that line on your CV that will now nail you that job that's actually going to be a good environment. I mean, I'm not a fan or an advocate of suffering in order to, you know, progress. I think the more you're passionate and enjoying life, uh, the better the results and the outcome will, will be. Uh, but, you know, you know, sort of to answer your question, I think uh, if, if the Alan DeGeneres show would be advertising and marketing that they have a great work environment, then I think that's also not helpful for them because right. we're in a we're in long-term game. And so long as this discussion isn't about how to get quick wins that are not gonna last, like running a sprint and just like getting those quick wins and getting money that's not gonna, that's gonna, and, and not get li lifelong clients, uh, you know, that's not a discussion to have with me because I'm, it's not my mindset and I don't believe in it at all. Uh, and, and for the people who want to run a marathon and want those long-term wins and be authentic, then, you know, even for the Ellen DeGeneres show, I would should suggest, you know, st st just sitting with them and thinking, okay, guys, let's face it, your work environment sucks. What do you offer that would be a good reason to work for you? And just well, say what that. you said, you said it was like the resume. I think people understand that. I mean, she is like the pinnacle of talk shows as an example. But I think I'll, yeah. well, let's bring it back. First, uh, Akiko Nakashami says hello from Sapporo, Japan. I have no idea where in Japan that is. I haven't been where I want to go. All right, Nadia, I, well, I agree been. with what she's saying. Have you? I've never been. I, the culture there is amazing. They're such outliers. Oh, uh, she said, okay, amazing. she wants us to actually talk about what makes a good statement right. First, let's talk about mission statements. I think, in general, this is my opinion, is I think they're radically overrated. I think they're. In, I, not that they're overrated. It's I think what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to a public standard that's going to be impossible to meet, especially when people are going to judge you through there, through that through that lens. Do you know what I mean? So let's yeah, say you say yeah. let's say we're going to provide the best customer service, da 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 da, right? And then you have excellent customer service, whatever you're providing. You know, when you say with the top customer service, whatever. So then people would say this company is a lie. This company is a scam, even though you just might have had a bad day, let's say with service or one of your employees or something like that. I'm, I'm worried that, do you think sometimes making a, a public mission, like an actual mission mission, do you think that can be, do you think you can set yourself up for failure, especially given how critical people are? Yes, but it can also make you a lot more accountable. So if you know it aligns with your values and it's something that you actually strive uh, to be, then once you say it out there, like once you shout it from the roof, uh, it's sort of going to force you to align your internal procedures around it. So for the example of the customer service, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna require a company to have procedures that actually uh, help them generate that amazing experience, customer experience. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's problematic. I think 
a company has to think well and hard about what they're actually saying. And sometimes it's just the race to who has the coolest slogan. And there's not, and it's a bit, basically a little bit of a hot air balloon with not much in, in it behind it. Uh, so I think uh, it has to be genuine. And I think it's 2020 and people sense inauthenticity. Um, right. But I do think, you know, it's a good idea to have those, those conversations and as teams and to really make a list of all those values uh, that people that, that people in the company feel that reflect the actual company value. Because, you know, it can't be a theoretical, if, if it's not a company that was just founded, this shouldn't have to be a, con a theoretical conversation. It should have to be a conversation about, okay, guys, what is really the bond here? What really makes us unique? What are our cool values? Not what we're going to write on the wall. What's the day-to-day -day here that is special and is the co core values? And then another layer is to understand the storytelling aspect of the business because you know you have to communicate the business all the time and not just through uh, a mission statement because the mission statement is just one bombastic thing. Whatever I agree with you, it's not that important. But you have to sort of understand your story. And it's important to be interesting. It's important to grab attention. And, and sort of tying down to what uh, the, the, the nice lady that I forgot her name was saying before that we're in the business of, uh, of you know, grabbing attention. attention. That's, Nadia. Yeah, Nadia. So that's, that's really true, but um, it's, there's such a thin line between grabbing attention and being interruptive. Uh, and, and I think that it's really, really important not to cross that line. So you can grab attention in can a way that example? actually adds value. Yeah. Give an example. Yeah, so, can you give me an example of a company that, let's say, is as opposed to grabbing attention. My. Yeah. You know. If you just like, um, if you just do a banner ad, uh, Google Display or whatever, and you shove it into people's faces, then you invite them to buy, and they're now busy doing something completely different. They don't know who the company is. They don't trust them. They don't care about them. They're not even thinking about buying their solution, and that company is completely regarding any buyer's journey, any intent, and they're just you know, interrupting very old school style is pretty much like doing a billboard. Uh, and I think that's a waste of everybody's time money. And it's definitely not going to create any report. But if a company is busy researching their target audience, researching the challenges of their target audience, and then tailoring their messaging towards what their target audience is passionate about and how they can help them overcome challenges and problems, then any message that they see across, you know, the World Wide Web uh, that resonates and has to do with helping them is going to actually grab attention in a healthy way and then it's a matter of delivering and not just being there for the sake of uh grabbing attention like actually mean it actually deliver hi what's up omri right so uh alone kaplan gillette out a Hina said i don't know what she's referring to but gillette put out a Hina. i think is what she meant to write uh alone if you want to Alon Kaplan, if you'd like to add more details to that, uh, that'd be great. Um, so, okay, so let's say a company wants to write, let's say you're a startup, right? You're a tech startup, and uh, let's just say you're in cybersecurity, just to kind of make it easier. What do you think would be a good mission? And, or you know what, let's take a step back. What should you avoid no matter what from your mission? What should you not say that you are or that you do? Is there like kind of things like don't go there, there's promises you can't keep, it might come off bad. Like, is there certain things you would say one should avoid? Yeah, all of that, all of that. Like, don't go there. Like, don't don't make promises you can't keep. Uh, and also, like, don't become so confusing. Like, I see many cybersecurity companies dumping a lot of info uh, that nobody. I mean, I don't know if nobody, but I think the average uh, reader doesn't understand why they should care about it. Uh, what it means. Right, but it's usually um, not real. If it's B2B, then it doesn't matter. If you're if you're B2B cyber, the average person isn't your target audience anyway. Why not? They right? offer, so is that, uh, so a lot of them offer services to companies to, you know, protect them. Oh, to companies, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, usually their target audience know what the hell they're talking about. So if you're talking about some kind of maybe cybersecurity related to like autonomous driving and the specific technical aspects of it, I mean, if you're not you're not working, let's say, at the, at the relevant companies at the relevant job functions. They're probably it's probably it's almost better maybe to uh, speak. A, a, you're a content writer, so you might understand this better. Um, shouldn't in in a sense, shouldn't you speak the language that's of your industry so they know that you understand them? Yeah. So that's what I was going to. Which means you I could think... exclude uh, means you'll exclude a greater audience because you're focusing on the audience. 
oh God, you're not speaking to everyone, to everybody ever. You're always speaking just to your audience and don't be afraid of that. Always speak right. to only to who is going to become your customer and it's totally fine to exclude everybody else. Uh, there's a great book called the, uh, by Derek Sievers. Um, I forget the name, but uh, we can maybe add it to the notes or something later. Uh, but it's it's really good. And it talks about how you just need to speak to your tribe. You don't have to speak to everybody. When you try to speak to everybody, you're not speaking to anyone. You lose it. Uh, yeah. And so, oh, by the way, the book is called Anything You Want. It's really recommended. Um, so what it's a good I would title. Do, I just, Sounds right. like they are speaking to everybody in that title. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But he's good. Um, so, I mean, what I would suggest to, that, to a cybersecurity company, but I would suggest it to all companies, uh, is to start by speaking with their target audience. So if you already have customers, talk to them, ask them why they chose you, ask them what the journey they went through before they chose you. Did they maybe compare you with others? What, were they, what did they care about? Because a lot of the times what you sold them and what your salespeople told them isn't really the reason they chose to sell, to, to buy. They were just already ready to buy and they understood the value. So I would truly understand what are the pain points that they had to overcome using your solution? How did you help them? How are you helping them? What do they need? Uh, while at it, I would also ask them what else they need from you because that's a huge opportunity to also learn more all the time. I think keeping constant feedback loops is critical for any business. Uh, and, you know, just in general, I think a business shouldn't go on auto cruising also on content creation. So it's always important to get feedback from the audience, from prospects, from clients, uh, and to tailor the messaging in accordance with that feedback and what they tell you and what they care about. Because a lot of the times that cybersecurity company is just going to be shouting from the roof stuff that they think is important, but doesn't resonate with that company that needs their solution. Does that make sense? Right. So let's say, we'll get to comments in a second. I'll, I want to address them. Actually, there's interesting ones. Um, so let's get into it. So first off, should, in general, do you think, um, is there, is it better not to have a value mission because you don't want to set yourself because people might no. misinterpret? Or it's always better. So what, no, what should, should your value, you should. So if you're a tech startup, you're well, let's say you got $10 million in funding, you're 30 employees. What do you think, what should be included or excluded? How would you guide someone in making uh, making a mission statement that actually speaks to the, should it speak more to the internally? Is it more important for externally? Um, kind of like, how, how would you guide, how would you guide a, a tech startup in making a, a tech startup that has revenue, let's just say, um, in, in getting like a, a good mission statement? to start internally and then make sure that there is a sync between the internal conversation and the outside world. So really try to understand internally, what is it that we care about? What is it that we deliver? What is it that we do different? Um, and you know, it doesn't have to start with specifically with the product. It can start with us as a team, uh, especially in the world of startups where pivot is not a rare thing. Uh, and even when pivoting, a mission statement can still hold true. So it's a matter of, a startup is very much about the people that comprise it. So those people sitting together and really making a list of everything that they care about and what they want to do. Uh, and through that honing uh, some statement that can be agile. I don't think a mission statement has to go with them for life. It can be, it's very okay to change with the times, but I think if they come up with a statement after they discuss this internally and feel very good about it, and then get feedback from current customers, assuming there are such. And if not, just go to social, go to friends, go try to get as much feedback as possible and just see. I don't even, I don't even think they should see if it's legit because I think if they feel it's cool, then it's cool. I just want the feedback I would want is, does this resonate? Does this really sound like it's who we are? Because if it's not, then right. it's just a matter of communicating. Something is still unclear. We're still maybe in the right. realm of uh, features and not benefits, and we have to be clear. Right. Well, I know one thing though to think about maybe is to consider just uh, a little devil's advocate is think 
when you do change, like obviously you can change it, whatever, but I mean, maybe if you're a bigger company and you have more eyeballs on you, when you do change it, people will be critical of it. Been like, oh, why'd you get rid of that? So, I mean, if you remember, Google used to have like a slogan called like, don't be evil. And then they ditched that. And they're like, of course they ditched it. They're evil. So you're, like, you're setting yourself up for criticism. You know, when you hear so he decided to, to change. So keep in mind when and if you pivot, say things that are probably accurate and that you think scalable, let's say as your company grows and as you pivot, that and that you have many more employees, many more clients, and maybe and adapt to different industries that hopefully it could still be relevant. Um, so they they don't uh, they do move things on. Let's address a couple of questions. Ellen Calvin talked about uh, Gillette Reese. They had a uh, they put out a commercial against masculinity. Yeah, I remember that actually. They actually got a lot of blowback for that. And it was you're a razor company for men, and they like straight up attacked men. It was uh, trying to yeah that that was, was uh, that was counterproductive. You think it was good? I think, as I know, a lot of people didn't like it. Obviously, as uh, this person, it didn't either. Um, Nadia said, uh, which is interesting because you can put out a message. You're trying to virtue signal. Some people will find it virtuous. People will think you're just trying to share it, and it could be counterproductive. So they think it goes exactly to the thing like, to what we're saying is you can give out a mission. It might seem good to you. It might seem good to some audience, but a lot of your audiences, you you might lose them, especially if your product's only for men, uh, like like Gillette, predominantly for men. Nadia said, I recently heard from a former Airbnb marketer director. There's no such thing like just B2B or B2C. Let me show this comment. Uh, let's speak about human to human. Human works humans, connects with humans. Human make business humans. Okay, so I actually have some strong opinions about this. First off, she's 100% correct. Everything is human to human in marketing, in sales, in your targeting, in your audience. But when you and... Uh, but I also feel like I've said this myself is that like when it comes to messaging and marketing and sales, you have to think of the and content, uh, of course, and you would know this more than most is that you have to know that you're talking to an individual, like you said, like to your audience, not to the greater, right, to your audience almost as individuals and the challenges that they're having, not to the greater need. Um, so I understand that. Um, but sometimes I feel like, you know, they, these comments there something like that i've said that i said a very similar statement myself um, and i agree with it it's kind of like uh, it almost dismisses the difference between b2b and b2c and when it comes to marketing in general there's a huge difference in uh how you approach b2b and b2c for example if we do advertising for b2b which is most of our clients we have one methodology one process one spreadsheet and we b2c we actually have different people on our team working on b2c um, so even though you want to keep the end user in mind and be as human human as possible it's totally different I also find B to C because it's a much shorter sales cycle. I find it's much easier to be human. Uh, it's much easier to be human to human. B to B, there are many more decision makers, as opposed to so it's not as even though you still need to be human to human, as opposed to let's say if I'm selling you if I'm selling phone, I want to connect with you as possible. But if I'm selling, let's say I don't know. Salesforce, right? And it's, there's going to be a lot of decision makers and influencers and a lot of people that are going to be involved in in buying your product versus your competitors, you're actually in a sense more company to company because you're not human to human. You're human to a group of humans, to a company that has a lot of restraints, a lot of constrictions. I'm playing with devil's advocate here, right? It's less human to human. So it's very easy, I even disagree. though it's true. Good, this is perfect. Good, good, you disagree. So we'll get clarity out of this. So even though it's important and we must be human to human, but there's most definitely a difference between B2B and B2C. And because uh, you you have many more humans to deal with when you're B2B. So we have yeah. ads for many of our clients, we got to speak to procurement, and then we got to speak to the tech people and the people that are going to sign off in regarding the risk and who's actually going to freaking implement the software, which is a big which is a big headache, you know what I mean? And so there's so many humans involved that in a sense it's kind of like team to team maybe as opposed to human to human relative b2b to b2c B2 to at the end of the day you are human to human we are speaking to humans but it's not like one human to one human i think it's kind of more of like humans to humans maybe what are your thoughts uh so i think it's a hundred percent human to human and even more so on b2b okay uh, wonderful how because calm. this is interesting because i'll give you like the most cliche example but like b2c uh i don't know um person buying a, uh, a shirt on asus okay no humans involved not really oh everything is human to human that's like the premise here but uh for b2b the the longer the sales cycle the, the the more expensive the the transactions that has to go down the more decision makers there are the more relationships are on the table 
So it's always a matter of building trust and uh, nurturing a relationship between the person from one company and probably a few people from another company, maybe a few people from both companies, but it's still all the more. It just, to me, that just means, yes, we're all, it's humans making decisions with humans. And by the way, if those humans don't trust each other, um, that deal is not going to go down. Uh, but on e-commerce or B2C or whatever, if I like that shirt, uh, unless I, I don't know, I hear that uh, Zara were doing something so terrible that I can't, like, I, I just, like, it doesn't correlate with my values. I'm going to buy that shirt. And trust right. isn't really that much of, a, of an aspect here. I trust them as a yeah, brand. You, I know I think they're going to get the say shirt. That, but they don't mean it. I mean, like, there's, like, slave labor and yeah, I'm going to buy the shirt in probably China, in hand, yeah. And people are still buying... I mean, if you buy, I mean, China's concentration camps, you know what I mean? Like, how yeah, many, you know, so, so I don't know how many people are pre, they, you know, they'll call, they'll call the, their political leader that they might disagree with, no matter what country you are. They like to call them Hitler and a fascist, but then they go and they support actual, you know, yeah, yeah, fascists that are murdering out, innocents. You're calling out BS and you're right. And yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, that goes to our topic, actually, is the virtue is. Yeah. Is there's a lot of people they they say look at how great I am calling people out and look at how great I am but then they go uh, and then they go around and do like uh, you know do business with the Chinese Communist Party because so you know not... what at some level and I'm sure of this at some level we're all hypocrites I want to believe that we're all trying to be the best people that we can so we make our well we're all we inconsistent to... I wouldn't say we're all hypocrites uh, I, I this might be nuanced but there's a difference I think hypocrite is if you go out and you like like this is the flag because this is what I stand for, you know what I mean? And then you go and do the opposite. I think inconsistent, we're all inconsistent, that's for sure. But I think I think hypocrisy yeah. is for those that actually go and preach one thing and then go, you know what I mean, and buy yeah, and, and buy a thing with like Fair enough. Like, I mean I'm more I, I'm more comfortable you know, with that description. So I'll take now it. Been, uh, I'm comfortable with what description? The inconsistent? The people are inconsistent? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling more comfortable to be labeled as inconsistent than as a hypocrite. So thank you. Right. No, it's human. We're all inconsistent. Our goal it doesn't we're we shouldn't human. justify our consistency. Right. Right. Everything's human. Yeah. Human. Right. Well, we agreed everything's human. Human. But anyway, so you actually bring up a really good point. It's very interesting. So like in the sales process, right? So I think there's different stages in the sales process. It's nothing's more human to human than B two B, right? B two B is more human to human than B two C. Right, particularly if it's software, if you need to speak to a human, it, it depends. Yeah, we're buying, not talking about guitar selling. Right. right, exactly. Right, if you need to speak to a sales person, then that would be that would be the case. Right. So, okay, so I get it there. And then the marketing, also, you want to be human to human, but there is a challenge. So, like, if you go on Twitter, which is a basket, which is a dumpster fire, I don't recommend people. But if you see the the companies that are doing able to relate more to their end users are often more B two C. Uh, often, by the way, food and beverages seem to do very well at communicating and, you know what I mean, being part of the conversation. I, f um, I find that it's much harder for B2B companies, which I know your clients are mostly B2B also. So, I mean, do you, I don't know, do, do you find that it's harder to do social, to make uh, connections on social media when you're posting from a company page? I think, I feel like it's a little, yes. I find it to be very yes. difficult, right? Which it, brings back to, uh, someone asked about solopreneur um earlier i don't remember um you know, but there, there's something there's something to that so like i we're going live right now on my personal profile okay my linkedin profile we're not going i also have live for my wadi digital page which has over like 5500 followers okay so it's a significant amount of followers on linkedin but in the end of the day people are following Yoel, the individual, and that's many of them that are following Wadi Digital are following you for that. I feel like uh, it's very difficult for, do you think it's difficult for businesses to come off as human uh, for B2B in general? And, or maybe we can just skip to what we want to hear is how can we be more, when you are, when you're posting from a company logo, right, for if you're in B2B, right, um, how, how do you become, how do you show off that you are a human company made of humans caring about humans? So, Especially yeah, if you're doing I mean, some boring like, technology. Yeah. Okay. So there's stuff that you can do, but but I will say that the bottom line is the success that uh, that we are seeing when when positioning the people in the company versus the company profiles is dramatically more higher with the people. Uh, but having said that, uh, we know that we can't ignore the company profiles. So there are things that can make a company look more human. Um, like for example, you know, humans being work at the company. So 
sharing day-to-day experiences, showing the office, uh, doing a spotlight on a team member. Uh, if you're doing some sort of fun day out uh, in days not like uh, when there's like a global pandemic, uh, then you share that. Uh, happy hours, um, you know, interviewing people and talent on the team, uh, everything that can give it like a human angle. And I think there's companies that do a pretty good job on it. Like, I don't know, MailChimp is probably a good one. Uh, across the board, they have like pretty strong profiles. Um, but yeah. I any, mean, t- any company in Israel? Just real quick off the top of your head. No, but uh, I mean, they probably are, but I just can't think of anyone because, you know, I'm typically following uh, the, the people and even with the companies that, that we provide services to, there's not one company that I can say, wow, we're like really rocking the company profile, like always like really helping position the people within the company. And that's like on top of it, like, yeah, we have to also do the company profile. Get cut right. Off. Yeah. N- Nadia writes that uh, for com. No, no, I heard you. Uh, the video froze for like a half a second. Nadia wrote, yeah, exactly. Name yeah. of Yo- Yoel. My name attracted her. Uh, my His individuality and I could judge by reading his posts and what he shares. Right. And then she wrote, companies, it's hard, it's hard for them to show individuality. Maybe if they have a good statement and mission that you're teaching now, so uh, they can easily stand out from brands and dozens of other companies. And she gives an example of my heritage diet, because I think this is a great comment. So I kind of want to bring this up. And I think it kind of, I think it ties much of our conversation here uh, and a lot of what we do together here. Um, right, so, so the way, right, we, we want to stand out and how we is actually, she's tying in the statements and missions to actually what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, so I think, so using your statement and mission is a great way for a B2B company to show that you're human. Yeah. So let me ask you, we have on, on my website, on Wadi Digital's website, we have a uh, really customer service centered, uh, right, results driven, customer service centered. So I mean, we don't have a mission page like this is our mission. It's kind of more like a tagline um, in a sense. So people kind of understand where our values are. Right. So, um, but um, maybe I'm not bold. You like I use that word. Uh, maybe I'm not bold enough to uh, to uh, or I think very few people are to actually put like a full mission or a full statement, especially for a smaller company. But we do put kind of a tagline that kind of explains our personality as a group of individuals. Uh, do you think that's an, Do you think that's enough? Do you think maybe that's a better strategy than making one than a more formal val- uh, mission? I think any method that um, makes the text relatable and human uh, is, is a good way to approach things. Uh, I think you know, those army type, I'll take it to that direction, but like, you know, in the army, in the corridor, there's like lists of values uh, and they're very detached. Like uh, you don't walk and you don't read it and you think, okay, this is like, uh, this is grounded. Uh, so I feel any any way of taking uh, what you feel and what you feel that you reflect uh, and, and putting it into words and then publishing it is definitely a good idea. Yeah. And I don't think there's like one formula for it. I think the more you're personal and, you know, you know bring out what's unique about you, the more you're closer to, to resonating and being like genuine. So be genuine. That's that's I think my core message. Awesome, great. Um, so what do you can you can you think of any examples? You think uh, any mission statements? You think that have been ever or value statements that have ever been wrong, or any examples where people, let's say, uh, by people I mean companies. They could be very small companies or very large, um, and not necessarily one off, but maybe uh, where they they say one thing, but like uh, you know. I mean, just to show that they're just to try to get people to think great about them, but it doesn't necessarily mean to translate into any action. Uh, can you give any maybe bad examples? You don't have to name the company, of course. Yeah, I mean, and I also don't think that uh, it's it means that that company as a whole is shitty. Because, for example, I can tell you from personal experience that sometimes Amazon really disappoint me uh, because they sort of put the people and the service above all. And I think they maybe just went through a period when they were outsourcing uh, their customer service and weren't pretty, weren't really educating them on how to handle situations. And I had a few cases where I ordered stuff and the answers that I got were super disappointing and absolutely not in line with all the slogans that you keep hearing from them. 
Uh, and I think that happens a lot with respect to customer service because I think customer service is like a buzzword that's being abused. And, you know, Amazon is like an example of a company that is always like delighting to the extent that if they do anything wrong, you're super disappointed. Uh, so I think customer service right. is definitely the, the place where it hurts when it doesn't, ha- when, when a company doesn't deliver. Right. Um, right. That, that, that's and, what I was like alluded to earlier. Is that be careful, yeah. like when you change your name or if you just fail once or even perceived to have failed, right? People don't know the whole story. They'll use that and they'll clobber you over the head with it. And I, I can give actually also a personal example uh, that I know where, um, you know, I have to do my, uh, I have to check internally what went wrong. But like, uh, this is a bit personal, but like I, I'm involved, I founded the nonprofit uh, to help businesses during the during COVID. Uh, and we, we got on board like the really top uh, mentors in Israel. And uh, we were telling businesses, we are, we're still, we're telling businesses, if you need help, uh, to, if you've been hurt by COVID uh, and you need help, then maybe we can help you. Um, but since it's like a nonprofit and we're still sort of trying to organize things ourselves, um, we had this video where we're shouting from the roof how we're going to be helping to save the world. And then I think a lot of people got disappointed because when they filled out the forms in our website, we had so many people coming in and asking us for help that we weren't able to answer at a pace where I felt that uh, we're delivering something that's in correlation to our statement and what we're promising. And that's something that I had to really stop and think, okay, how are we gonna really improve this quickly? Because there's such a dissonance there and it's a problem. So, you know, it's, I'm not, so I'm, I'm, say, I'm sharing this uh, to say that I'm not judging other companies. I, I get it uh, and it happens to me too. And I, all I can say is that, you know, if your heart's in the right place, then all you can do is really, really try to fix. Uh, if, if you give a wrong impression, try to see how you make that impression right and soon. Right, got it. Where do you think, where, where are you, you personally or, or, uh, or Bold's uh, greatest challenging in living up to your missions or being held to your standard publicly that maybe there's like where personally, what in your experience? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I have to think about it more. What about you? Like for what? I mean, maybe like, I mean, in general, is that a, would probably be like, when like we're extremely customer service centered, that's why we put it on the top of our site and we are, but then, so sometimes people think that like, that means uh, we'll do whatever, whenever, even if it's outside our scope of work um, or things like that. So we have to tell them sometimes, no, we'll help if we can a little bit here and there, but you got to put down and say, we're, we can't help you with this. Right. Or, um, or we're another like, you know, so like sometimes drawing that line, uh, it might be misinterpreted, but we can better serve them for what we need and what we agreed to do for them by actually putting down that line. It's actually serving the client uh, more by staying focused. But it does just because you know that, and even if you try to explain that, that's not that doesn't mean that's how it's going to necessarily be received. Because everyone comes to every relationship, whether a personal relationship or business relationship, with certain expectations, certain baggage, both positive and negative, uh, us included. You know what I mean? So sometimes, you know. When I say the word customer service, you might hear it differently than, than the way I mean it or than anyone else that's listening now might define it differently also. So, you know, so, you know, it's, again, it's, it's a funny thing about words. Uh, but when, when we made, in general, when we made Aliyah, we just saw what, what terrible customer service is here. I don't just mean in marketing um, and serving technology companies in general in Israel. I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, be part of the problem. I'm going to be part of the solution. So I went out as like my crusade, uh, you know, but, it, and then the goal is how can you help more people without giving up, uh, without giving up your core values as you continue to grow so far, we've been able, we've been able to do that, but of course it gets more challenging as we continue to grow. Um, so we're, we're doing everything we can to continue to stay grounded in our values. Uh, their values and yeah, helping people so, so it doesn't get so thank you for sharing that uh and yeah that, i i can totally relate and i feel like uh to answer your question uh i i feel like you know the whole idea of uh of being a trusted advisor and adding value and living that and then sometimes having to say no and sometimes having to sort of put a line and say listen this is uh, this is really beyond scope is something that's always a little bit of a challenge 
Right. Awesome. Great. Um, all right. So we're going to finish up. If anyone has any other comments or questions, uh, now would be the time to ask. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your nonprofit, how you're helping people, and we'll start. To, we'll wrap this thing up in a couple minutes. Yeah, sure. So I, I sort of started talking about it uh, just in the previous example, but basically it's called Mili, uh, and we are really trying to help. Businesses. What's the website? How do you spell it? Uh, M I L I uh, dot M fifty one dot C O. Okay. So uh, like we have like an yeah. So we have like a lot of mentors on board uh, from like the top of the of different industries in Israel, uh, and we really our mission is uh, to help businesses who are struggling due to the to COVID uh, to help them through uh, networking and through marketing advice and through any advice that we can. Um, just to get back on their feet. Uh, we're really trying to not uh, promise something that we can't do, but it's really dangerous to sort of bring hope in a place where uh, it, you know, you might not be able to deliver, but uh, you know, our hearts are in the right place and we're really just trying to help. There's no agenda behind it. We're not, uh, there's nothing but just uh, all of us as a team wanting to get together and see if we can help other people. So if there are businesses, uh, it's like it's for Israel at the moment. So uh, if there are Israeli businesses who are struggling and think that we can uh, help, then we're happy to evaluate and look into that. Awesome. I, mean, I would love to be a part. There's anything I can do to help. I think that's an, aw an awesome thing you're doing. It's an example of not actually... This actually, this is a great example of many uh, that are virtue signaling. I uh, see other people in the in the industry say, how can we help? We want to do the da da da. And they're more like just trying to stay relevant. They're not actually going, they're not putting in the actions. So this yeah. is, this is uh, a great example of you're not, you're not just virtue signaling. You're actually living, you're living by your mission statement, right? And in a sense, yeah, and that's, super that's really impressive. Yeah, I'm super afraid of virtue signaling, like super afraid of that. So yeah. you're, you're afraid of virtue signaling? Is that what you said? Yeah, you know, I'm afraid that at the end of the day, people will get disappointed. So I'm really trying to line expectations. Right, exactly. You're, you're, you're right, like, come off as virtue signaling. Right. And that's what I'm saying, right. yeah. Your intention was never to virtue signal. You just don't want it to be perceived as virtue signaling. But many exactly. people, their intention is virtue signaling. They do it for the clicks, the oh, eyeballs, right. you know what I mean? Or uh, as you and I were talking about you know, all the time. And, and in the end, you know, they're they're uh, not inconsistent. They're actually a lot of hypocrisy going on, um, especially in the, a lot of businesses and large corporations. We're seeing that too. Yes. Awesome. Great. Uh, Noah, where can people find you? Uh, pretty much anywhere across the internet. So LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, my website. Uh, my email is noah at bolddigital.com, 1D. And I think that covers it. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much for joining okay. us. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me privately. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Noah. Thanks so much for joining us, Noah. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. Me too.